Today at the National Press Club, former Socceroo and human rights activist Craig Foster. The sports broadcaster has used his profile to campaign for refugees and asylum seekers and for Australia to do more to limit climate change. Craig Foster with today's National Press Club address. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club and to the COVID-delayed 2021 Australia and the World Annual Lecture from the Australian National University's Australian Studies Institute. That's a lot of Australia's. I'm Mark Kenny and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, First Nations people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to thank ANU Vice-Chancellor Brian Schmidt for his support for this annual lecture series. Professor Schmidt has been down to make the formal introduction of our speaker today on every one of about three or four occasions in which this COVID interrupted event has, uh, has been postponed and he passed on his deep regrets at not being able to be here today. Can I also thank Professors Sally Wheeler and Paul Pickering and Fiona Preston for their leadership in making this event happen. And of course, Morris Riley and his team at the National Press Club and their sponsors Westpac, of course. In its short history, the Australia and the World Annual Lecture has attracted some outstanding speakers. Former Foreign Minister Gareth Evans, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg, First Nations Administrator and Scholar Pat Turner AM, and now Craig Foster. Of course, you will know him as a Socceroo, a Premier League player, and as an SBS broadcaster, but he's also an adjunct professor of sport and social responsibility. He's one of Australia's most uncompromising and forthright human rights advocates. Everyone, would you please welcome Craig Foster AM with the ANU's delayed 2021 Australia and the World Lecture. Thank you so much. Australia and the world, Courage, solidarity, humanity and leadership, or refugee torture, human rights abuse, xenophobia, and climate inaction, from local to global. Third time lucky, and I'm so thrilled to be here with you all today. I acknowledge this land was never ceded by its traditional owners, and that the soul of this country can never be whole until justice is done. We're failing ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, and the most vulnerable people both here and around the world. And we must accept responsibility to become the leaders and contributors that the world needs us to be. In advancing today's discussion of Australia's position in the world, how the local becomes global, I'll argue that our torture of innocent refugees, failures on indigenous rights, and intransigence on global warming has twisted our own humanity made us profiteers and exporters of suffering, damaged the international compact on displaced people, fed exclusionary and nationalist politics around the world, slowed decarbonisation of the planet, and left us and others fleeing climate disintegration in coming years at extreme risk. As an immensely proud Australian, I have to say I'm more disheartened and certainly more frequently embarrassed at how the world sees us than ever before. We're a nation unwilling to accept our responsibility to the world, and yet a people so desperate to have pride in who we are. Perhaps that's why we cling to our international sporting achievements. We long to excel as a nation. But while I'll prosecute our isolationism and selective humanity in the short time we have, this is a profoundly hopeful speech because I believe in the power of everyday people everyday Australians to make change. I've seen it, lived it. Australia is crying out for authentic leaders because there are so few willing to hold true to principle and not deviate from what is best for its people and the global community. The system has collapsed under existential challenges. Pandemics and climate disasters are the new normal and the response must prioritise this generation and the next but the political horizon is shortened to just days, weeks, months, when more than ever, we need intergenerational solutions and purposeful courage and commitment. We're all searching for people to trust that have our best interests at heart. In this vacuum, community leaders have found new prominence, many of them 
brilliant women speaking truth to power, and they have greater social trust than many politicians because leadership is about sacrifice for others, not the sacrifice of them. Putting people first, caring about us, our future, and that would require a wholly new form of Australian politics. When COVID hit, public figures and media wrestled with the perversity of how many Australians, particularly the elderly and infirm, it's permissible to let die so that the economy might live. And the government cynically turned a health crisis and once in a generation opportunity for a green led energy and economic revolution into a gas led recovery, literally adding more fuel to the fire. From a lump of coal to a bottle of gas. Energy Minister Angus Taylor used the Russian invasion to fast track seven gas projects in Queensland, New South, New South Wales and Victoria, when the urgency for independence should have expedited our transition to clean energy. Economic and environmental vandalism. UN Chief Antonio Guterres yesterday called it mutually assured destruction. Destruction, yes. Mutual, no. Because the Australian people have seen through the scam. Environment Minister Susan Lay last week celebrated the federal court decision that her ministry and government don't have a legal duty of care to future generations of Australians. <laughs> Imagine. On three of the most critical global issues of the 21st century, requiring a multilateral approach, human rights, human displacement and climate, Australia is a central contributor to a breakdown of international agreements and global cooperation, and this puts millions, in fact, billions of people at risk. That's our international legacy in the 21st century so far. But I believe in a very different Australia. One where race is no longer a weapon to divide, the aged are not a profit centre, the economy serves the people, we promote the dignity of each person irrespective of where they're from or how they arrived, and Australia is a beacon of integrity, human rights compliance and leadership in the world. An Australia where we acknowledge that we almost wiped out the oldest living culture on the planet and after the dismantling of the white Australia policy have resolved never to let xenophobia and racism shape our national identity, public discussion or policy again. Australia's first Prime Minister Edmund Barton. There is no racial equality. These races are in comparison with white races. I think no one wants convincing of this fact, unequal and inferior. The lifting of this historical veil of racism fuels a fierce determination to walk with our First Nations and we regard any attempts to videate our truth telling as antithetical to our responsibility to atone. We take a rainbow armband view of history, we might say, where every colour is equally privileged. We're resolved to create an Australia hostile not to each other but to racism itself. And as a secular country, anti-discrimination regarding gender, sexuality, ability, colour and race trump our wonderfully diverse religious beliefs. We choose equality as our national faith. We continually interrogate our institutions and policies to ensure equal access for all because we feel obligated by the contradictions in our own beginnings. Though invaders and immigrants, no one told us to go back to where we came from. The world needs a shining model of global citizenry and inclusion as nationalism and racial politics thrive. We can be that model. It's clear that our refusal to look back though is at the heart of so many inequities today. Racism underpinned colonisation, a fuelled federation and still infests much policy and media coverage 121 years later. It's a festering sore on the national psyche that manifests in dehumanisation and mistreatment of innocent people and ongoing Indigenous disadvantage. So let's all take a deep breath then because we must go back to move forward and yes, we need to talk about boats. Whether the first fleet's arrival on Invasion Day 1788, asylum seekers fleeing persecution or citizen-led flood rescues, it's a fitting starting point as the east coast of Australia drowns. And let's not forget the boat trophy that sits proudly in Australia's prime ministerial office. 
That boat symbolises suffering, death, racism, xenophobia, deception, lies and propaganda, myopia and the degradation of Australia's humanity. It encapsulates perfectly who we've become, that it sits lovingly on Scott Morrison's desk, speaks volumes about him and us. Australia has been so bombarded by decades of dog whistling, xenophobic and racist portrayal of other that we literally are willing to let innocent people rot and die. The most vulnerable people on earth, refugees. But I know what Australians are capable of, the force of our goodwill and compassion and the extraordinary capability of this country from the sports field to the bushfires, from the floods to save Hakeem. You must resist attempts to convince you that torture and the breaking of humans is strong and care and compassion is somehow weak when the exact opposite is evidently true. It takes strength to lift another person up, a community, to give something of what we have to another. It takes real courage to speak out for a colleague or a community when they're in need. I went back to my hometown of Lismore recently to lend a hand amid the despair of catastrophic floods and listen to stories of locals carrying others on their back to safety in the swirling current. People hiring helicopters, commandeering boats to rescue strangers, extraordinary resilience and courage during immense trauma and loss. Australia was deeply inspired by their instinctive, unselfish actions, putting others first. That's care. Volunteers giving everything they have to house, clothe and feed, feed people they've never met. That's compassion. Care is the force that strengthens a nation street by street, community by community and builds a better world. No, I'll tell you what's weak. Beating up on innocent refugees, the family from Biloela, gay kids, the homeless and unemployed. Lying about asylum seekers to justify shameful policy is weak. Legislating so that medical professionals can't tell the truth about torture is weak. Leveraging asylum seeker lives as political capital is weak. From the Immigration Restriction Act of 1901 to today's Migration Act, the journey from alien to illegal has always been about keeping so-called undesirable non-white people out. The terrible irony is, First Nations aside, we're all asylum seekers, aren't we? Those who came by boat, like the Fosters in the early 1800s, as convicts and assisted migrants were seeking asylum, not from war, but hardship. Others were refugees from the law. Maybe your ancestors fled lack of opportunity, education, class disadvantage, or the Second World War. For those who've come across the seas, we've boundless plains to share. Really? Having spent a life in the multicultural game of football, I know too well how hostile successive multicultural communities have found these boundless plains. From the Italians and Greeks considered too swarthy during the white Australia years, Vietnamese boat people when the term first became weaponised in political and public commentary, Muslim Australians who faced far greater discrimination than just Pauline Hanson's racist stunts, and Sudanese Australian gangs. Today we have several hundred asylum seekers and refugees stranded offshore in Papua New Guinea and Nauru, and more than 50 Medivac refugees onshore, all in their ninth year of incarceration of one form or another. Nine years. They're boat people, as are we. And we destroyed their lives with a singularly vicious, abject cruelty. It's rightly said that Australia treats animals with greater care. And many prime ministers and ministers would be jailed if they subjected a single animal to like treatment of refugees. It's staggering, actually, to think what we've done to innocent humans. It's a stain that will live with us forever. The boat people who tortured boat people. Immigrants who tortured immigrants. It's insanity on every level, financially, humanitarian, global citizenry and reputationally. OK, the reason we're revisiting history here is because it's not possible to truly recover our humanity without first understanding this historic cycle 
that we're all caught in. Today's refugees, Indian Australians criminalised during COVID, Australians stranded abroad, they're all just the latest victims. Exclusion has always been a fundamental part of our political and cultural life. The problem is we're now at the point where we'll do literally anything to keep people out, including killing them. 13 refugees cages offshore by Australia are dead. Thousands more broken, their bodies and minds destroyed. An Iranian refugee in prison for three years, 23-year-old Omid Masumali, was so traumatised, hopeless and broken that he burned himself alive on Nauru in 2016. He sustained horrific burns that were nevertheless survivable if he was treated adequately, humanely. It took 31 hours for him to receive medical treatment or painkillers. He died an agonising death. A young man with a mother, her name is Elam Aruni Hassari. The way Australia rejected him and took his life will forever torture me, she said. We named our baby boy Omid, which means hope in Farsi, because we had beautiful dreams for him. Now all we have is the cold stone of his grave where he died lonely and innocent, lonely and innocent in a foreign country. Australia has taken our hope, our Omid. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. And I'm so sorry for the destruction of your son, Elam, along with the subversion of our own sense of goodness. This is Australia? When Omid set himself alight, screaming, this is how tired we are, this action will prove how exhausted we are, I cannot take it anymore. Then Minister for Home Affairs, Peter Dutton, made clear that in his view, refugees were burning themselves alive in attempts to come to Australia. I don't have the words to adequately articulate the depravity of that statement. The Queensland coroner would later find that indefinite detention and a total collapse of hope caused his self-immolation, but this is how the Australian people are manipulated to justify horrific policies. Dehumanise first, compensate later. Border politics, fear-mongering and the triggering of the Australian national psyche by cynical politicians and compliant or complicit media has been a central part of Australia's cultural life since well before Federation, three times Prime Minister Alfred Deakin. That end put in plain and unequivocal terms means the prohibition of all alien coloured immigration and more. It means at the earliest time the deportation or reduction of the number of aliens now in our midst. The two things go hand in hand and are the necessary complement of a single policy of securing a white Australia. This endless cycle is deeply embedded in cultural concepts of whiteness, worth, identity and fear and all political parties have been involved, such as calls by Immigration Minister Arthur Caldwell in 1947 for Australia to populate or perish. We have 25 years at most to populate this country before the yellow races are down on us, he said. We must, all of us, reflect on the speed of our descent from mandatory detention just three decades ago under the Keating de government to indefinite imprisonment today for an average of 689 days in conditions that are deliberately inhumane and punitive. This is 12 times that of the US. Canada's average is just... 14 days, 689 days. Turns out we are leading the world in the torture of refugees. Media must stop perpetuating the terminology that euphemises torture and masks obscenities. Terms like illegal, detention, not prison, transitory persons, not vulnerable people, border security, not immigration. Word by word, a conceptual infrastructure indefinitely detains the national mind. Xenophobic language that Australia risks being swamped, invaded, the floodgates opened, have repeatedly and endlessly been used for 200 years to divide communities, score political victories and scare the population into acquiescing with racist, xenophobic and lethal policies throughout our pre and post colonial history. None of them were real, but they were devastatingly effective and culturally corrosive. 
Can't you see the pattern? Please recognise when and why these terms are being used and Australian media stop using them. Since September 11 in Tampa, when former Prime Minister John Howard lied about children being thrown overboard, I know you remember it because that lie has deep divisive consequences that pervade today. Subsequent governments have either fuelled hatred of refugees for political gain or lacked the willingness or ability to respond. This inhumanity has bled into all aspects of our social and public life and desensitised all of us to suffering, death, inhumanity. Did you know that different sections of Manus Island made to house innocent refugees, right, had military names? Oscar Delta, Foxtrot and Mike compounds. Are we at war with basic principles of human decency? We erased the names of human beings and gave them numbers. That's a phenomenon pioneered in Nazi extermination camps. The Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp official record says that prisoner numbers became a synonym of dehumanisation. Is this really us, Australia? One of those numbers and my good friend is here today. COA 060 fled Iran as a persecuted Kurd and is a poet, singer, songwriter and artist. On Manus Island for six years, he was so damaged from infested food, illness and lack of medical care that he would plead for treatment daily from a privatised system that banks billions in profit to punish the most vulnerable. One day after years of pain, he wrote another treatment request, this time in blood, regurgitated involuntarily from his stomach. We took eight years of his life for political gain. His name is Farhad Bandesh. Thank you, Farhad, and sorry, my brother. The question for the rest of us is how many times must we say sorry? It'll happen as we pay hundreds of millions more in compensation to refugees in coming years, but entire political careers have been constructed from this pain, and they won't care. I travelled to Port Moresby several years ago to find a catastrophe of human suffering by companies that have gorged at the public trough, the free market of pain. One Queensland family-run company, Canstruct, will make $101 million profit on Nauru this year alone for just 100 refugees. A company that had no staff, no balance sheet and ended no open tender process has been paid around $1.5 billion of our money in the last five years. Inhumanity pays handsomely. That family is now on the rich list as the Australian newspaper trumpeted that they were raking in the cash on Nauru. And this is Australia? Refugees are so rich a political resource that they've not yet even been allowed to resettle in New Zealand for over seven years. They'll enter Australia through the back door, it said. The same language used by the UK Home Secretary recently in attempts to keep out Ukrainians fleeing of invasion. Just one of the litany of politicians and governments around the world trumpeting Australia's policy as the new model of nationalism, nativism, xenophobia and racism. As Australia erects legal and rhetorical walls and cages humans, from France to Holland, Denmark to Hungary, the offshoring of innocent persecuted people and building of physical walls are the new must-have racist political accessory. If you don't want them to come, you shouldn't treat them all that well, which is what the Australians do. Do we want them to come here? No, we don't. So what do we do? Australian solution. That from the Netherlands. Ukrainian refugees have been welcomed everywhere in a way those of Yemen, Iraq and Afghanistan were not. And racist rhetoric about white Ukrainians being compatible perfectly mirrors that of white South African farmers in Australia. Scott Morrison quickly said that Ukrainians will go to the head of the queue. That's another cynical lie used to conjure magical notions of legitimacy. There is no queue. There is 
No Q, Australia. Only a human lottery. And the media must refuse to propagate these dangerous narratives that cloud the judgments of Australians. Given our involvement in Afghanistan, we have a duty to welcome more than just 15,000 Afghans, a number split over three years and taken from the existing intake of just 13,750. Do you see now how others who've been waiting for years to be part of that number are arbitrarily left out and have no certainty whatsoever? Also in the room today are the extraordinary Marwa Moeen and Farhat Kowastani, two courageous young Afghan women who recently settled in Sydney. Farhat is an incredible women's rights activist and Marwa assisted 15 of her university friends in Kabul by hiding them in her family house in a single room for a week while the Taliban hunted door to door and interrogated her father. I thank Green Senator Nick McKim, Independent MP Zali Stegall, Immigration Minister Alex Hawke, Foreign Minister Maurice Payne and all Australian Embassy staff in Islamabad, Pakistan for their outstanding work to help these young women and many more, including the Afghan women's national football team, now settled in Melbourne and recovering their lives and careers with Melbourne Victory with the help of Football Victoria. Every time the Afghan women play will be a globally significant act of defiance for girls and women's rights everywhere. Incredible courage, all of them, all of you. And you represent the true face of asylum seekers and refugees. Thank you. For others, seeking safety means limbo in often deplorable conditions lacking basic medical care, safe housing and sanitation with violence, trauma and death all around. Now, try telling me that Australians would not flee for a better life by any means, please. One of you. I'd have my family on a boat in a flash. I'd pay anyone for it. So would you. If you think that's wrong, by all means, stand up. As would every politician up the road at Parliament House and every single media commentator demonising asylum seekers as somehow improper. So it's long past time we re rejected simplistic notions of right and wrong, ways to flee, of worth and worthlessness, of queues and queue jumpers that pollutes the issue and contributes to policy where over 20,000 refugees are currently on temporary visas in Australia, often for very extended periods without certainty, many without education or Medicare or allowed family reunification. Let's fix the system, not kill and maim the victims of it. We now have our own internal refugees after bushfires and floods and spent many months locked down for those of us fortunate enough to have a home. Perhaps for the first time we can glimpse the terror of displacement, if not conflict. Maybe the curbs on our own mobility during COVID and the mental health co-committants might open a small window into detention. But whereas we spent 60, 90, 120 days, those in the Park Hotel with Novak Djokovic have been in prison for over 3,000. Less than 1% of refugees are resettled every year and the international system of displacement is so damaged in part by us that refugees are forced to flee across borders and seas from conflict that we're often involved in or our Western allies fund and arm. The more than $10 billion spent on offshore torture since 2013 could have developed an entire regional infrastructure to support displaced people instead of forcing them back to danger against fundamental principles of international law. But please understand, everyone, there are no votes, no political capital in fixing the system, but plenty in further persecuting the persecuted and turning the Australian population against a migrant group again. Government after government, century after century, decade after decade, the same pattern repeats. The only non-lethal answer is to work multilaterally to enhance international cooperation with our global and regional partners, a process in which Australia can barely participate, let alone lead, after what we've done. Similarly, 
In a world of human rights abuse where China commits genocide against ethnic minorities, oil-rich nations criminalise the LGBTI community and suppress women, Saudi Arabia attacks Yemen armed by the USA, the ongoing occupation of Palestine, Narendra Modi's anti-Muslim nationalism, and Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping attack press freedom, export the surveillance state, jail dissidents and wage war, our own human rights transgressions undermine our capability to be the force for good we can be. Until we stop the torture of refugees, imprisonment of Indigenous children, disproportionate incarceration of First Nations, advocate for deserted Julian Assange, release whistleblowers, stop raiding journalists, increase public accountability and anti-corruption measures, leave our charity sector be, provide greater scrutiny of political donations and state capture, and reverse the national shame of Indigenous disadvantage, our credibility on democratic principles and human rights is severely damaged when we should be a world leader as a multicultural nation. One day, I hope that the Prime Minister will not have a boat, but an outstretched hand on her desk to signify, <laughs> to signify support for all in need, for diversity, multiculturalism and anti-racism, and the resolve of Australia to let no one suffer, go hungry or without a roof over their head. An outstretched hand also to our global family to impart our strong sense of equality, the humane treatment of all, and solidarity on existential challenges. Like saving the planet. Has there ever been a more embarrassing act and by a country that was proudly a founding member of the United Nations than fossil fuel giant Santos sponsoring Australia's booth at COP26? I mean, seriously. Scott Morrison unveiled a uniquely Australian plan to rely on technologies not yet created, tested or proven. Unique, too true. <laughs> Australian, not this one. The most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report makes abundantly and frighteningly evident how far behind the world is in responding to the climate emergency and how vital unity and leadership is. The reality is that, is that as the world heats up and human displacement is forecast to hit unprecedented levels, Australia is at the forefront of delegitimising international principles of human mobility, placing tens of million people literally at risk. We remain captured by mining, threatened and gaslit about the risks of transition when the evidence of bushfires and floods is of the incalculable human, environmental and intergenerational cost of doing too little. The industry's proxies, media and politicians have misled and scared us so successfully that we're literally drowning in floods, cars are floating by schools in Sydney, millions of hectares of precious bush and billions of animals having perished and wondering what the long-term costs to our kids will be. <laughs> but hang on, hang on. Our taxpayer funds shouldn't be paying to remediate a problem the fossil fuel industry was aware of decades ago. Climate justice demands that the largest polluters pay. Send the damages bill to AGL, Energy Australia, Origin, Woodside, Santos, Rio Tinto, BHP and the mining magnates. And Rupert Murdoch, who platformed climate denialism and misinformation for decades. The editorial shift to support a net zero economy is very welcome and long overdue, but incalculable damage is done. We can start with the more than 10 billion in annual subsidies that underpin the energy model of the past, which can retrain the entire mining workforce and invest in renewables that'll underpin our children's future and position this country as a leading contributor in the world. Andrew Forrest plans to be a world leader in green hydrogen and calls on fellow mining companies to transition to renewables. It's fantastic. A great Australian renewable energy success story will be something to celebrate and a powerful demonstration that the largest emitters can lead the change. But last year alone, Fortescue emitted over 2 million tonnes of greenhouse gases, more than 178 countries, and more than that again from Scope 3 emissions by its customers. Tremendously exciting plan, Andrew, love it. And your voice will be so important in holding your own industry of mining and particularly fossil fuel extractors accountable for the state of the planet today. Transition is one thing, justice is another. Mega fossil fuel extractor and emitter and fellow promoter of climate denialism alongside Clive Palmer, Gina Reinhart now sponsors the Australian Olympic Committee. Particularly apt given the world's oceans were at their hottest for the third consecutive year and the northeast coast of Australia has become a pool. 
Ironic though, since sport will be directly affected through extreme weather events, the loss of snow, floods and heat waves, but it's a time-honoured tradition for tobacco companies, human rights abusing states and now fossil fuel to appropriate the social legitimacy and licence of sport for an industry seeking to improve its image and avoid accountability. Whitewash, greenwash, sport wash, it's all the same. I'm delighted that our amazing athletes can be remunerated for their brilliance. I am. Of course, but no fossil fuel company should be anywhere near global sport. The most severe environmental effects will be felt on this island continent and by our Torres Strait, Pacific and South Asian neighbours. And not only are we abandoning them to an unlivable future, we can hardly call on the rest of the world to help us as we drown or burn when we refuse to join, let alone lead. A growing number of G20 developed economies have announced meaningful emissions reductions by 2030 with a handful of holdouts such as Australia, said the head of the United Nations yesterday. And Antonio is right. Meaningful action and leadership on climate action, human rights and refugee pathways and resettlement would be a powerful international legacy in the 21st century for a nation that has always taken pride in punching above our weight on the global stage, but has turned our gaze inwards when the world so very badly needs us to look out. We invaded by boat, now torture people who come by boat, and the way we're headed, our grandchildren might live in boats by this century or the next. But I believe in a different Australia with the capability, strength and courage to confront the most difficult challenges faced by women and mankind and as a leading catalyst to both a livable and humane world. It all starts here at home. What you and I accept becomes Australia and the local becomes global. And we Australians are capable of so much more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. It was an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily powerful address uh, and raised uh, a, a, a huge a number lot. of really important points. It did raise a lot. I hope you're enjoying this very vertical couch as yeah, well. Yeah, this is good. It's, yeah. good. it's good. It's nice to see you finally. Um, I noticed there's an election coming soon. Um, uh, yeah. Perhaps you'd be uh, interested in running the Canberra could do with a. I, I was thinking. I was thinking it might be time for a new Craig yeah. in Parliament House. Um, it has slightly different views. Um, look, I, we're going to have a series of questions, and okay. we have a number of journalists here. I'll, I'll just lead off, if that's OK. Um, I suppose it needs to be said, because you made such a compelling case for, uh, uh, for the argument about, you know, for us to be accountable for the way we've treated refugees, mm. the way we've run our immigration program, the rhetoric around it and everything else. Mm. Um, John Howard used to say that if you have an orderly immigration program, then you can have quite a high level of public support for a strong humanitarian element to that program. That's correct, isn't it? I think what we need to do is interrogate what humanitarian program is about. So what's happened here, and John was very much a part of it, is by framing those who have to seek asylum by fleeing across borders as somehow improper and wrong. And we've never had the discussion as a country about why it happens and actually what our contribution to it is. So the answer is that we should have both, but we have to look at this concept of asylum. And over certainly the last 20 years since 2001 in Tampa, the very concept of having to flee uh, has been so destroyed, so polluted, that beautiful Australians that I speak to regularly find it very difficult to have that discussion. And that's why I can see it. That's why the speech this morning, when it comes to human displacement, is, a mu is much about understanding this cycle 
and how so many governments and prime ministers and media throughout our history have continued to trigger us uh, to see a particular group as unworthy. That's, we have to overcome that. But they, but they are speaking to a, to a strong sentiment in the community, aren't they? I mean, well, I mean they're part of... Sure. You, you argue that yeah. they, that they uh, engendered... Well, this, this is where leadership part. comes. This is where vision comes. This is where humanity comes. This is where decency and dignity comes. Like, and so I, would you look at someone like Angela Merkel in the Syrian yeah. crisis? Yeah. Uh, she invites uh, refugees to come there, yes. and I think 1.7 million eventually right. settle there. It does engender, though, the AFD and uh, a lot of right-wing, yeah. uh, extreme right-wing resistance as That's well. True. So there are, there are ways in which this needs to be handled. But I guess that overall it's a success there, right? Yes, uh, and you're right, because uh, so much of this discussion is prevalent all around the world. Mm. But let's not forget, Australians, we're feeding a lot of it. You know, the point I made there in the speech about many, particularly a right-wing candidates and governments around the world and, and, the, and the strong men, you know, they're looking at Australia's policy as an appropriate way to keep people out. And, but what we know is the way we tried to keep asylum seekers and refugees out actually killed people. And it has degraded our sense of common decency right throughout our society. And now we're at a place where we pick and choose what worth is, whether that's between countries, nationalities or colour, and also between the, the way that people are forced to use the international migration system. So instead of us now contributing to the breakdown of that system, wouldn't it be extraordinary, a wonderful contribution for Australia to say, we had a problem and the way that we dealt with it and tried to fix it, we recognise now has resulted in terrible destruction of people. Like, no one can argue that. Uh, and we have to find a better way. And we're prepared to be, if not lead this discussion, uh, and we want to bring the countries together around the world to do that. You know, when I went to advocate for Hakeem al Arabi, who was a refugee and now is an Australian citizen, beautifully. He's the uh, Bahraini football player. Bahraini football player. Yeah. And I spoke to many embassies in Bangkok. Their language and responses to me were always, so you're an Australian and you want us to come and help you and sit in court and advocate who's a refugee. Um, like, how are we going to do that? And I said to them, well, we need your help now. But once that's done, and hopefully we are successful in this campaign to free him, I give you my undertaking that when I get back to Australia, I will do what I can for whatever length of time within my capabilities to change that, because it's not right. Uh, and this is what this is about. But again, rather than just advocating repeatedly, continuously, and sometimes emotionally for the, the destruction of innocent lives, I want Australia to look at the cycle that we're caught in. Uh, because many politicians are so skilled at utilising the current atmosphere, uh, public context of the day, and we lack people who are prepared to say, we think Australia is more than this. So whatever it is that John or others have to say, you know, it's, it's very easy to, to trigger Australia right now at this point in our history, given what the media and others have done to asylum seekers. It's very easy. You could go get elected, you know, on that and other xenophobic policies. This is the reality of where we are. But at what point are we actually going to change it and recognise where we've let this country descend to? The point I made also about Indian Australians uh, is, I, I hope, an important one. We actually got ourselves in a position where we were prepared <laughs> to criminalise Australians, you know, Indian Australians, uh, 
seeking to return to their own country uh, during a pandemic. <laughs> of course. I mean, that's just... I mean, seriously, that's, that's, that's absolutely crazy. And so we're all here, and, you know, so we, we kind of got ourselves in a position as a country where we actually think, and I see all the faces around the room, you know, people go, oh, yeah, but, you know, we need to be safe. I, I want to be safe. And so, you know, that's justifiable. It's not justifiable. It's just that everything about the last 20 years, particularly since Tampa, has been all about safety. It's been all about security. It's been all about securitisation, militarisation. That's actually what it's been about. Uh, and so that just bleeds into everything else. All right, look, we're going to go to some questions from the media. I've, I'll just have one quick one as Kimberly okay. Keynes comes to the, to the microphone. And that is, you mentioned the I Stop These trophy in the Prime Minister's oh. office. The Conservative argument in defence of that uh, has, prima facie, a lot of moral weight behind it, which is that people were dying at sea because of an unregulated uh, trade of, uh, by people smugglers mm -hmm. and that they stopped that. There is a moral foundation to that argument. OK. Do you agree? No. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm putting no, it... I like your I'm question. Put, I'm I putting it, question. As long Thank as, you. As long as you understand, <laughs> I'm putting it as a question. Yeah. No, I'm totally right. I, I, that's exactly right. The point you're making is is perfect. Um, there is no morality in killing people and destroying lives. And, you know, my question uh, in return is, are we not capable enough to design a system where people don't die, burn themselves alive and suffer for the rest of their lives? I mean, that's just crazy. Um, it's a justification and we can no longer accept justifications for what's happened to Farhad and thousands of other people. There is no justification. Uh, and so that one, we, but if we don't get to that realisation, this is just going to go on and on and on and on and on. And my primary role at the moment is trying to bring that cycle to an end and get us to look inside the system and work and realise how uh, we've all been turned against them. Yeah. You know, the queue is a great example. So the language that's used uh, is just completely wrong. It's, it's, it's irrelevant. It's not relevant to the international migration system. It's just not. But, so it's, a, but it's a powerful reduction. It's incredibly of the, of powerful. The, uh, it's incredibly powerful. That's why I mention it here today. Yeah, yeah. And of course many, you know, in human rights and in a refugee community, they're now in such a difficult position that in order even to want to discuss these things, you know, it's felt probably rightly that it contributes to, you know, to the narrative. But at some point we have to open the wound and have a look inside and say, what the hell is going on? Uh, it, the reality is, and there's, there's many examples of that. Um, so it's wonderful that we responded to the Afghan crisis. We didn't respond well enough. I think, you know, I would imagine a majority of Australians would believe that, given that we were there 20 years. Uh, uh, however, um, we should have responded uh, with more. But what you need to realise, everyone, every Australian, is that those 15,000, 10,000 10, visas and 5,000 for families to come, they come from the existing cohort. Humanitarian intake right. quota. Right. So let's just imagine, please, as Australians don't have the opportunity to do it much, but just imagine your family and your, you know, you flee Sudan, you flee Yemen, you flee, you flee uh, elsewhere and you're stuck in a camp. Uh, many of these camps are inhumane by the very nature, because many countries around the world now, let's not forget, want to mistreat asylum seekers as a deterrence. That's what we did, right? Yep, we accept that. Yeah. Uh, so what happens then is you're in that camp and you're there for years and years and years. Your two, three-year-old, four-year-old children can't study. Uh, you know, the nutrition is horrible. The sanitation is awful. It's, li it's literally often a living hell. But you think, well, it's better than dying back home and I've got my kids here. So you're trying to live day by day. You, you are a registered refugee and you're waiting for a country to take you. And then Afghanistan hits and the overtake by the Taliban. And all of a sudden, countries around the world say that's the priority. And therefore, we have to tri triage this list. All of a sudden, these people here, 20,000, became 40,000 in Canada, which is brilliant. They, you know, they become the immediate priority. So you're gone, you're left behind. There is no queue. There's just a list and a lottery. 
It's really important that we understand that yeah, because the use of this term constantly, constantly, constantly is used because of one of the beautiful aspects of our nature in Australia, which is our historic cultural sense of fairness. Okay, that's where, it, that's where the line is drawn. The line of fairness is drawn well above Farhad's head because he's not part of it. But we do have a very strong sense of, uh, uh, you know, fairness in, in many ways. But because that's culturally there, it's incredibly easy to trigger as well. Yeah. And yeah. any cynical politician can just say, well, those people aren't, you know, that's, that's not right. They're coming the wrong way. Take that's unfair. Jumps. And Australians, you know, culturally say, oh, OK, well, that's bad. So those comments uh, around the children overboard was also triggered the disgust mechanism of human beings, which means it went much worse, which is why I say it pervades today. Because then Australians said, well, you know, I'm told not to agree. I don't understand the concepts of human mobility, and I didn't a couple of years ago. This is, you know, um, I'm not criticising Australians. I always say, I, I, haven't been here for the, I haven't been here since 2001. I'm totally part of the system. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just that some life moments brought me into it and, and I was staggered by what I found. Um, so all I'm trying to do is create a, some, some new awareness. Um, okay. But these concepts have really contributed greatly to, you know, the, the uh, destruction of us and them. Yeah. Kimberly Keynes from the West Australian. Hi. Thank you, Craig, for your powerful address. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about women's sport. In the past week in the US, the integrity of women's sport has been in the spotlight after the first transgender woman won an American sw swimming event. This comes after Prime Minister Scott Morrison last month supported a bill in Australia to exclude women, like female trans women from women's sport. Do you think we should be moving towards increasing gender diversity in sport here in Australia? And do you support the Prime Minister's decision to back the bill that would make it easier for sporting organisations to ban someone from a female team based on their biological sex? I wouldn't trust, given what happened with the religious discrimination issue recently, um, I wouldn't trust any of those uh, discussions uh, at the moment. Uh, what I believe in is human rights and non-discrimination on the basis of gender. We've seen this in athletics internationally, globally, with the World Athletics Association really struggling in, in recent years, uh, and actually supporting invasive procedures on, uh, on various athletes in, a, in an area where they don't have the capability, uh, the skill or the knowledge to be able to contribute. Um, so I think uh, it's an issue that all of global sport and Australian sport needs to come to terms with. Uh, but I wouldn't be... I, I, I'd be making sure that we examine the issue appropriately under the frameworks of human rights, not under the frameworks of what's considered fairness in sport or sport integrity or these matters. It's about humans. It's not only about sport. Anna Henderson from SBS. Thank you. Anna Henderson, SBS World News. I, I wanted to ask on the back of Mark's previous question whether or not you think a change of government would change the system, given Labor brought back indefinite detention and being in Parliament at the time, a lot of people on the crossbench who were prevaricating decided to back it because they truly did think it was the right approach to stop deaths at sea. And do you, do you have another system that you think is more workable? What is the solution here in your mm. view? And I'll, I'll ask something else afterwards. <laughs> okay. So we'll, have to, we'll need to be reasonably brief here. I know we they're quite big questions, but we've got a few to get through and okay. I, I, I hogged the... You've uh, got another couple. No, no, I hogged the microphone <laughs> earlier. I, I actually do, uh, but we're not going to have time for okay. that, unfortunately. Um, can, I, I guess to just... Uh, can, would Labor do anything differently in your view and what is the solution you think should be in place? Well, let me say this. Uh, all the comments I made today is what I expect out of whoever's in government, OK? And so I'm asking all Australians to interrogate the policy uh, of everyone in their federal electorate and the major parties as to the matters that I've put to you here. And I'll do the same when the election comes. The issues 
the understanding of the issues is the most important, uh, but at the moment, uh, no party, or perhaps the Greens, but of the two big parties, both have ground to make up in terms of humanity and refugees. Okay? And both have been party to it. You know, over, the, over history, let alone the last 20 years. Your second question was? What's the solution? You talk okay. about a different system. Uh, is it naive, as some have painted you, to say yeah. there is another system that's an option? Well, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, because let's all ask the, a, a follow-up question. Is it naive not to want Australia to torture people? Is that naive? So let's just deal with that firstly, because you know, that, that's a common refrain from anyone who thinks that this is fine. Um, is, it too na is it naive to think that Australia can treat people, irrespective of how they come here, with some decency, some dignity and humanity? Is that unacceptable? Is that impossible? Well, it can't be impossible. Um, it has to be possible. So let's now have a national discussion about what that possibility is. The reason we're not having the national discussion is because we're still stuck in this cycle of demonising the people on unjust and incorrect uh, platform which avoids us having that discussion. The only way forward is twofold, is for us to work with regional countries, many of whom are not signatories to the Refugee Convention and therefore forces asylum seekers to come to Australia, so they have to come through multiple countries that aren't party to it. Uh, and secondly, for us to take some leadership on the global level. That's what I would love to see. And then very briefly, yep. 150,000 applicants are waiting in Afghanistan right now. They did what the government said. They put in an application. They're waiting for it to be addressed. Uh, we're told that the department is painstakingly going through those applications. Do you have any advice for how they could perhaps help people who are dealing with uh, a life and death situation? Uh, you want my advice, sorry, to the people or...? To the government. Oh, to the government. Um, <clears throat> the system is broken. The whole system is broken. And that's in part because we've approached the system from a position of exclusion and security and demonisation. We've got over 20,000 refugees currently on temporary visas in Australia without many rights. The reason is that because of the context is that the, the speed of processing any uh, refugee asylum seeker claims have consistently become longer over decade, decade, because there's no great will to actually do it in a humane way. The most important thing for Australia is to recognise that that's a case and for us to try and come to terms with the fact that they're humans. That's all. You know, it's a wonderful question, thank you. Because, you know, we have to look at them in a different way. And the only way we can do that is by understanding, you know, the, the international framework better. Uh, therefore, we have to redo the system. So, for example, the discretion given to various ministers at the moment is, in my view, improper. Uh, the rule of law is most important. And in recent decades, there's been attempts by various governments to, uh, to deride the federal court and others, their jurisdiction, to rule on the cases of refugees and asylum seekers. That's wrong. So the justice system should have responsibility. It shouldn't be an arbitrary decision by any ministers as to who is or who is not worthy. Uh, that's one example. I'm hoping that soon we can have this national discussion without all the xenophobia, without all the fear-mongering, without all the talk about being swamped. Let's just have a discussion about humans, how we treat them now, and how we can treat them more humanely in future, and what that means for our policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A question from Nick Stewart. Words, firstly. How important is it that journos like me who get tired of being assaulted when we talk about um, yeah. um, asylum seekers, uh, how important, or refugees, how important is it that we actually use the right words? Mm. And secondly, what do you say about a 
parliamentary party, for example, uh, let's just take the opposition, for example, which says that we are better than the other party, so don't push us too hard on our policies. Should we just let that by, or is it really worthwhile pushing when that may alienate some voters? Mm. Well, there they are uh, questions for voters who take a party uh, partisan approach. My approach here today is, and in my advocacy, is to hold the government accountable, also to give credit where it's due when they do make good decisions, whether that's this government or a different party, doesn't matter to me. I just want humans to be treated well and I want the climate to be protected. Uh, it's quite straightforward. Um, however, when it comes to language, language is the infrastructure of pain. It is the context of suffering and we have to better understand it and change it. When I went to um, uh, PNG and I met uh, someone whose name is familiar to many, many Australians, a brilliant journalist by the name of Beruz Bushani, he alerted me to that fact because he kept saying, this is not detention, this is a prison. You know, these are, these are guards, these are... You know, we've got Foxtrot and Mike compounds. We've got these things. And the refugees themselves are more alert than any to the system, they call it, that is built to dehumanise them. Language is a really, really important part of that. So I thank and I congratulate all of those journalists in the country who have tried to push back on that. Um, it has been a very difficult battle, certainly in the last 20 years, uh, but it's one that I hope we're going to win soon. Thanks. Question from Astrid Watts. Hi, Craig. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned in your speech about racism being rife in this country. We all know it is. Mm -hmm. um, with our politicians and media appearing to be scared of covering the truth, especially when it comes to our Indigenous carceration rates and, in hand, deaths in custody. Mm -hmm. How do you feel we, as the media, need to cover this better? And also, how do we repair the damage that's been caused to our First Nations people? Oh, gee, that, well, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Thank you. The last part of it, if you don't mind, I, that's my question to Indigenous Australia. Yep. Like, you know, let's ask them how we repair it, because I don't know. Um, they've, I already, they've already offered us a solution in 2017. That's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, so I haven't, I haven't lived it. They have. And, you know, that's the same principle uh, with any uh, disadvantaged, vulnerable people in the country. Um, so the Uluru Statement is, of course, the manifestation of the human rights of Indigenous peoples all around the world to self-determination. That's what I believe in. I believe they must have a voice because they have a right to a voice. Australia's refusal or withdrawal from kind of the globalist system in recent decades, I think Scott Morrison has made a recent change, but some years ago he called it the um, unaccountable internationalist bureaucracy. Uh, Negative globalism. Yeah, that's, you know, that's been, that's been important also for our First Nations because our unwillingness to want to talk about actual human rights, uh, which are just like really basic concepts like gender equality, you know, women's rights, um, and Indigenous rights are very fundamental to that, um, means that many Australians, I think, uh, aren't aware that on the international uh, framework, legal framework, um, our First Nations have that right and we have to give it to them. So I'm very confident and hopeful that the Uluru Statement is going to be accepted, well, in its current form, would be best. And what was the other part of your question? Um, just how the media should be covering it and yeah. things like that. Covering which aspect? Just covering the fact that the rates are actually higher than what... Yes. ...the yeah. Caucasian rates, incarceration rates in the Northern Territory, for example. Thank it you. is, I believe... Be quite brief. Okay. And I might be wrong on this, but I believe it's around the 90% of 
mark that all of the inmates in the Northern Territory in particular are Indigenous background. Thank you. So just really briefly, I know we're wrapping up, all I would say is along the lines of that talk, we actually need to open up that conversation nationally. I do believe that there's more Australians who want to have that today and we see it as, a, as, an, as an aspiration that the future of the country is going to be so wonderful when we walk together with the First Nations and the only way to do that is about justice. Racial justice is the same as climate justice and it's the same as uh, you know, human rights and refugee justice, is you have to admit and be accountable for what's happened in order to be in a position to lift people up uh, and give them equity, not just equality. Thank you so much. Thank you. And finally, a question from Maurice Riley. Uh, I ask this on behalf of Tim Shaw, one of our directors, who apologises okay. for being here. Uh, Tim asked, uh, local aid agencies report that 116,000 Australians either slept rough overnight or, or are considered homeless in, the, in this country. What do you say to Australians who are concerned about the welfare of their own country people ahead of increasingly increasing the current refugee intake to this country? So, sorry, the question is, am uh, I more concerned about refugees than homeless people? Is that the question? Well, that's the implication of it. Okay. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I okay. wouldn't want a verbal Tim Shaw. <laughs> All right, no worries. Broadly. Yeah. So I, I am and what's called a human rights advocate. Imagine that. Like when people first saw that, uh, when first said that, I thought, what a crazy thing that you have to actually advocate for humans to have rights. Uh, that's kind of where we are at the moment in this country. Um, and so that means the right to housing the right to food, the right to medicine, uh, women's rights, uh, uh, the right to um, you know, religious freedom, uh, non-discrimination, all of that. Yeah. And I'm extremely passionate, like I hope m many more Australians, f about social housing and about every single Australian having a roof over their head and food to eat every day. And if we can't, make, if we can't bring that to life, yeah. then you know, where are we? Yeah. Uh, Mark, on indulgence, yes, uh, is the central thesis today that you know the political class have failed in all these areas, and would we be better off arguing for a bill of rights? Oh, the answer is yes. We need uh, we need a bill of rights, definitely. Uh, the answer is yes. That's exactly right. That's, That's one of the theses. Yeah. Admirably brief. Thank you very much. Uh, before we wrap up, I've got to ask you a sports question. I okay. think Australia's playing a World Cup qualifier against Japan. Um, is that tomorrow night, perhaps? Yes, tomorrow night. Yeah. What do you say? Have we got that, a So our male national team, of course, our female national yeah, team, are, point, you know, extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, and so the male national team tomorrow, soccer is playing against Japan. Um, we are a little bit under strength, uh, and uh, we're in a bit of trouble. Uh, we need to win <laughs> the last two games. <laughs> in the next week against Japan, who are above us and are really in a good moment, and Saudi Arabia, who are leading. Um, we can do it. Certainly the game tomorrow night, I'll be there. Looking forward to going out to Stadium Australia. Um, on, at home, Australia hasn't lost, I understand, a home World Cup qualifier for 40 years, uh, but we actually need to win. Mm. So it's always possible in front of our home fans, uh, and then the final... It will, Hopefully it comes down to the final game away against uh, Saudi Arabia. If not, we might have to qualify through uh, third placed in the other group in Asia and then potentially against the fifth of South America. You all remember 2005 Uruguay qualification. How could so, we forget? Yeah, it's not going to be here, it's going to be abroad, but it could be another one of those. Uh, it's important to get there. Uh, so, you know, I, I wish them the very, very, very best tomorrow night. As I'm sure many in this room do and, and watching the broadcast. Craig Foster, thanks so much for agreeing to deliver this address.